presented by uh, Timothy Figaro. Uh, So I'll give a small introduction uh, about multiaxial fatigue for those who are not conversant with this uh, area. So multiaxial fatigue occurs when there is more than one load in more than one axis. And uh, it can be uh, one, due to multiple sources of loading, or two, due to complexity of engineering components imposing uh, geometrical constraints. So an example is shown here uh, in a crankshaft where the crankshaft uh, uh, is imposed tensile and, compre um, and compressive stresses from the piston through the connecting rod and uh, in addition to uh, uh, shear stresses. So the reason why we chose to do this uh, research is because we did literature review and found that there is no consensus uh, in which is the best model to use to predict the exo fatigue uh, especially under static loading, uh, static compressive loading. Then uh, we also found that uh, that is, uh, even though in literature you find that compressive static stresses uh, increases the fatigue life, uh, this behavior has not been well investigated. Where there is a, a static compression, uh, 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 where a static compressive stress has been implemented. Um, the other reason is because our material, uh, which goes by the trade name, uh, sorry, which goes by the trade name P558, it is uh, an austenitic steel with a low nickel content, and it's uh, in place of the nickel nitrogen is used to stabilize the austenitic phase. And uh, this material was uh, invented um, as a substitute to uh, 316L. And you can note the nickel content, uh, for example, when you compare with the uh, 316L, which has a 10% uh, nickel. Uh, uh, the other thing to note is that uh, you know the stacking fault energy is influenced by uh, individual elements and the interaction differently. So it is also not well understood how, uh, for this material, that uh, reduction of nickel and the high amount of nitrogen uh, influences the static fault energy and in turn the deformation mechanisms. Um, uh, so the experimental procedure, this is the sample uh, geometry that we use for the multi-axial fatigue. And uh, before that we had carry, carried out some tensile tests and obtained uh, these parameters. Sorry. And we obtained uh, and so that the yield strength <coughs> of the material is about 600 megapascals and the tensile strength is uh, 930 megapascals. Um, the machine, this machine is called Bionics 858. It's a servo hydraulic machine that inputted a uh, static compress, uh, compressive stress at the top end in addition to a cyclic torsion uh, stress. And uh, while the other end, or the opposite end, was fixed. So uh, on this table, it shows you the parameters that were used for the test. We carried, it at, uh, we carried the experiments at two compressive stresses, 250 megapascals and 350 megapascals. Where the shear stress was inputted uh, in form of angle, angles, and the angles of twist ranged from 5 degrees all the way up to 22.5 degrees. 
Uh, so this formula was used to calculate the equivalent shear, uh, the equivalent uh, strain amplitudes uh, from the shear stress amplitudes, uh, from the shear strain amplitudes. And this formula was used uh, when we, the when Mises equation was used to calculate uh, the equivalent stress amplitude from the shear stress amplitude and the uh, static compressive stress. So um, this chart shows uh, the behavior of the, of the material under 250 megapascal static stress. And on the y-axis is the equivalent uh, stress amplitude, and on the x-axis is the numbers of cycles to failure. Uh, when we uh, evaluate from the five degree angle of twist, we see that there's a very slight softening followed by a very slight hardening, as if there's nothing that happens within the material. Then for the 15 degree and 10 degree uh, experiment, we see a slight hardening followed by a gradual softening. Uh, for the high angle experiments, uh, 20 degree and 22.5 degree, we, find, uh, we see our primary hardening and the rapid uh, secondary hardening. Uh, so when we superimpose the curves for the 350 together with the 250 megapascal uh, curves, we see uh, that for the high uh, stress amplitudes, <coughs> there's a uh, it increases the primary hardening, but it does not have uh, effect on the secondary hardening. Uh, for the low strain uh, uh, stress amplitudes, uh, there is no uh, much difference between the two uh, stress, uh, static stresses. So uh, I want to talk about the cracking behavior. <coughs> so on the left is a sample at a high strain amplitude, and we see that the cracks are vertical along the, but, uh, along the specimen axis, which is, is in line with the principal uh, planes. We also uh, noticed that the samples were heating up on its own. Uh, we recorded a value of around 340 degrees centigrade. We still don't understand why. We are trying to figure out that if anyone has an idea, you can uh, suggest. And we also find that the sample uh, also uh, increased in, uh, in roughness. On the other hand, for the low strain amplitudes, the samples have had an X type of a crack or diagonal cracks, which is uh, 45 degrees to the specimen axis, uh, shown by this micrograph. And it's uh, indicative that the sample is cracking along lines of maximum uh, shear, shear stress. So this is a summary of all that I've said in the previous slide uh, in terms of uh, strain amplitude and the numbers of cycles of failure. But here, uh, for the samples that are in the mid-range, you notice that they, it has a mixed, a mixed type of cracking. Uh, so it's a, like a combination of the two uh, cracking behavior. Um, I want to talk about the electronic uh, <coughs> scatter diffraction, uh, ABSD. Uh, for the low strain amplitudes and for the high uh, strain amplitudes. From this uh, IPF map or inverse pole figure map, we see there's not much happening. Uh, we did not find any deformation twins, and we, the annealing twins, uh, they retain their integrity. Uh, when you uh, look at the kernel average disorientation map, we see that there is also low disorientation with the misorientation that was observed, uh, it was observed around the grain boundaries. For the high uh, strain amplitudes, we see uh, some, uh, we see deformation twins with a 60 degree point to point misorientation, and we see deform, uh, annealing twins losing their integrity. For the kernel average misorientation map, we see misorientation all around the the microstructure. Finally, I want to talk about uh, fatigue length prediction. Uh, we used the Smith, Watson, and Topper model, which is one of the uh, most common model uh, in fatigue in the materials of fatigue. And uh, it's a critical plane model, and this is the equation. Uh, so the parameters B, C, sigma F prime, and epsilon F prime 
and we absorb, uh, they were uh, obtained from the Mason, uh, Mason coffin and basket models from Uniaxio uh, tests that we have carried out uh, that I'm not showing here because of time. Uh, so those parameters were used and fitted in this model <coughs> and we were able to get the predicted life cycle. And when we plotted that against the observed life, life cycles, we, noti uh, we noticed that uh, the model is underestimating the fatigue life uh, by as much as uh, seven times. So we believe that this model is not suitable for those situations where there is a presence of static compressive uh, stresses. So next, we'll be applying another uh, model uh, called the Fatemi C model, you've heard about it. It's also another critical pain model. So we are also carrying more uh, multi-actor fatigue tests and pure additional tests. So it will be interesting to find out how that model uh, applies for this material and for this type of uh, stress state. So um, this is a summary of all that I've uh, talked about. The um, fact that uh, for the high scale amplitudes, there is increase in the amount of secondary hardening, the cracks are along lengths of maximum physical stresses, the samples get hot and change in roughness, there's a milling trees start to lose integrity, the deformation trees are observed and there's no physical transformation, there's a high disorientation all over the microstructure. Uh, for the low strain amplitudes, there's no great effect on hardening, the cracks uh, are along lengths of maximum shear stress, the samples remain smooth and they don't heat up. And uh, the anelic twins retain the integrity. Uh, deformation trees, uh, there are no deformation trees, there are no phase transformation, and there is relatively low misorientation. Generally, the model, uh, the Smith, Watson, and Topper model does not apply uh, for, for this type of material and for this strength. So, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank Day uh, Day. De and for uh, the National Research Fund of Kenya for providing funds to this uh, research, and for Viola uh, from Austria for providing the materials free of charge. So, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, are some questions or comments? Please. Hi, and um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, for your EBSD results. Yeah. Where where were they taken from? They were cross sections from like the middle of the tested specimens, or, or what location are those EBSD? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They were from the middle. Uh, sorry, they were from the middle. Okay. Yeah, and then they were. The, so the sample was. We, we don't let the samples get uh, uh, go up to uh, because of the of the of the sharing of the of the of the. The material, the, uh, it can be squashed and you cannot get meaningful data from that. So well, immediately we find a crack, we stop yeah. the experiment, and then we, we cut it into two. So from the middle here, and then uh, from there we get longitudinal and cross sectional uh, sections for the BSD. Is it right that the, the sample on the left, that one heated, but the one on the right didn't heat? Or did they, they both heat enough? No, this this one this other one doesn't heat up. Because I just wondered, maybe that makes a. Do you think that makes a difference to the EBSD results um, in terms of the amount of like dislocations that you see in your cam maps? Um, it might be, but uh, yeah, it might be interesting to investigate that. But uh, we for them we, we we do the same procedures. So we cut at the middle. Even this one was also cut at the middle and. Uh, both were investigated from the middle. Because, uh, yeah, I think uh, you compare to the original material and, and see, but maybe that, uh, yeah, the heating is a strange thing, but maybe it's making a difference to the ESD uh, dislocation structure that you see as well. Yeah, that's what we are supposed to think, but we have no explanation. So you, you, have, you have, like, no um, accurate explanation, or you have no clue why it's heating up? Because in fatigue loading, it's, it's well known, it should heat up, right? This is the dissipative mechanism, right? You're just pushing dislocations around in one direction, the other direction, one direction. So it's just dissipating energy every time. And it can heat maybe uh, 400 degrees is more than expected, but if it heats up, it's not a problem. It's not, that, that's actually related to the comma. So when you have the... Um, 
the, the high uh, torsional um, angle, then then you see in your calm map that the, that the grains are full of dissipations, right? So that there's a lot of the dissipation uh, by the dissipations occurring at that moment. Now that could be in fact what you're saying is that 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 due to this temperature that you get some self annealing, so some some of the dissipations could run out. So the the real in fact, that could be even be more sort of like dissipations than you think because of those, the sort of like a self annealing going on. But that's maybe a more, act, more, I would say, more problematic or like more complicated mechanism. But the basic mechanism of the heat up is just, yeah, just, uh, you're just <laughs> you're putting in all of this energy, this this mechanical energy which is converted to heat. It needs to convert to heat because you just turn it, you turn it back. In the end, the general shape is the same, but you put in the mechanical action. Yeah. But the, at, the, at the micro level, there's dissociations that move around and they go back and you, and that's just dissipation of energy. The yeah, funny thing that we have done with the other materials, like another material called Rex uh, 794, which is also an austenitic steel, but it doesn't heat up as... So no. it, well, it's, it heats it's, up but, uh, by 80 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As compared yeah, so, so it, it depends, of course, on the yeah, on a lot of things, of course, on, on the amount of dislocation, the dislocation density that you that you create, but also about the uh, thermal conductivity, and so it is. Of course, of course, but but uh, the, the sort of like the basic mechanism of of the uh, material heating up and fatigue testing, is, uh, I think that's all. Like yeah, so it's unless that uh, uh, you're doing something very specific, but I would say that must be the mechanism. You're putting in some mechanical energy, and and it's being dissipated on the on the micro level really by dislocations that, that move along. They move over glide planes and they go move back, and it's plastic dissipation and that leads to heat locally. And that seems to suggest like correlate with what the the, the the picture you show. If you can, if you see the gauge section again, so where the gauge section at, at the end at the ends where it becomes wider again. Then it's sort of like this coloring is changing because there the the loading here is less because the cross section is more. Right? So, it, uh, but you might want to look into the plastic dissipation and fatigue loading. Yeah, thanks for the. I'm, I wouldn't be too much surprised that it goes up to a few hundred degrees Celsius. Yeah. Right. Three hundred and fifty. Yeah, but as as I said, this is my uh, preliminary study, so yeah, I'm doing more. Fine. Uh, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to say uh, one sentence because you use sweet Wilson topper and you obtain uh, the scatter burn 7. 7 is too, uh, too, too big, should be no more than 3 usually. Uh, I know that uh, energy approach is very good. I can tell you this, uh, but ordinary sweet Wilson topper is good for union salon. It's necessary to look for other modifications. There are many modifications of speed was on top. Uh, two months ago, maybe one month, in materials, uh, I published paper in, uh, on the theory any modification of this speed was on top. Maybe if you yeah, use I, I some of this modification, maybe it will be okay. I saw your paper today actually, but <laughs> I'm not at time to. to yes, 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 yes. But energy approach, yes, I'm sure that this is the uh, good uh, solution. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your presentation and for the discussion. Thank you. And now we have the last